We are very fortunate today to have Nicole with us on the uh, little tax presentation. Uh, Nicole's on our emerging leaders group. And what is that? Scholarship winner. Scholarship winner. Way back so then. We, yeah. Once, once, once we hook them, we hook them. Uh, when they hook them good. <laughs> but yeah, she's, uh, she's been there very active in the society. And so this is what uh, we try to do with respect to leadership here. So I'll turn it over to Nicole. Thank you. Good afternoon and happy Friday, everyone. Um, Good afternoon. Like Ralph had mentioned, I, I am a scholarship recipient. I did receive the scholarship when I was in uh, college, this college scholarship, not the high school one. And from then on, I've been involved with the NJCPA. Just, I think it's very important to give back to the profession. And um, I've been in the accounting profession now for 12 years. I've been practicing tax. I'm a one-trick pony. I've never touched an audit in my life. So I'm um, pretty I don't know if I should say I'm pretty proud to say that, but definitely a one-trick pony. So it's this afternoon. I talk very fast, so if I talk too fast, let me know. I will slow down. Um, but we will be talking a lot about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and I'll just give you a little update on, obviously, individual taxations, because I also kind of love individual tax, which, again, I shouldn't... I'm not sure if I'm proud of saying that or not, but um, definitely love individual taxation. So with that being said, we'll get started. That didn't work. Oh, it's the button. <laughs> Yeah, hit that button again, and then hit There we go. go. Yeah, there we go. All right. So we're going to talk about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with. We're going to talk about the Postcard 1040, which I have kind of some good news for you in that department. Some of you might have already seen the 2019 draft form already. QBI, Qualified Business Income, Section 163J, Business Interest Limitation, and then we'll go into some miscellaneous issues at the very end. If you have any questions during, please, 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 I encourage you to ask. Let's make this a little bit more of a discussion rather than just me talking to you. Um, it just makes it more enjoyable for everyone involved. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it came in like a tornado. Um, if any of you do taxes on the side in addition to, to teaching, you definitely probably had the same struggles we all um, as tax practitioners had. It was effective 1118 and it will sunset effective 1 1 2026. So we do have this for the next several years. Um, who knows what's going to happen? We do have an election coming up. A lot of this is obviously contingent on, you know, politics, unfortunately. We kind of have to, um, we ebb and they flow, they flow, we ebb, whatever you want to say it. But the mission um, for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was to simplify taxes and to make it easier for the general population. And there was actually an increase in self-prepared returns, which you'll see on the next slide, the IRS did chart it out, and you will see that there was actually an increase in self-prepared returns, which people say, because of that increase, yes, taxes were simplified. Um, I'm sure on your own taxes, you didn't necessarily itemize your deductions. We'll get into that in a little bit, that the standard deduction was doubled. That was to simplify taxes. The Tax Foundation um, basically came out and said 80% of people saw a tax cut. This was um, higher, I think, than anticipated. But again, this is through April 15 data. It's not through October 15 data. So keep that in mind as well. A lot of returns that were more complicated did get extended. So those returns probably didn't fall into these thresholds. 15% saw no change, and 5% actually saw a tax increase. So, as you can see, I know the blues are very similar in shade, but there was actually an increase in self-prepared tax returns. Um, again, this is through the 415 deadline. It's not all inclusive because a lot of the more difficult returns did go out in October. So this just goes to show that through the uh, through the April 15th deadline, tax repair tax repairs did see a slight drop. So. I know it's probably a little small for you to see, but 53.74 versus 50, almost 56%. So there, there was a slight increase. So technically, self-prepared returns did go up. And this is e-filing receipts in millions. So provisions that are expiring before December 31st, 2025, again, this probably will all change. Uh, but as it stands right now, Medical going forward to 2019, there was a 10% floor. In 2018, it was a 7.5% floor. So in order to basically get any benefit for medical deductions on Schedule A, itemized deductions, you have to first hurdle over this rate, 10% of your AGI going forward 2019. 
Family paid leave credit and work opportunity credit are set to expire 2019. And 2021, we are saying goodbye to the solar credit. In 2022, we are saying goodbye again to bonus depreciation. Bonus depreciation has always been phasing out for as long as I can remember. They always say, hey, it's going to go away, but oh, no, it's back. <laughs> so they claim it's going to phase out. I guarantee you that will not ever happen because, quite frankly, it's a business incentive, and that's always something that there's a lot of flexibility with. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, it was back up to 100%. So. But yeah, they, they claim it's going to phase out, but we all know history tends to repeat itself. So so key takeaways from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, there is no alimony inclusion or deduction for divorce decrees that are executed post 1231-18. So a lot of, unfortunately, our clients who were involved in getting a divorce, you know, we told them to kind of hurry up and finalize it before 2018. Um, the, the person who, you know, the person who was get receiving didn't really, you know, they wanted to not include it in their income and the person paying it wanted to obviously, you know, deduct it from their income. But um, again, if you're in a prior agreement, you were grandfathered in, so they didn't really care, but we did tell our clients to kind of, you know, push the uh, gas pedal on that a little bit. The withholding tables were lowered, as I'm sure you all know, because this all affected you directly. And again, it affected 2019, the tables they had, you had to update your W-4s yet again for 2019. Tax rates, there was a lot of this that happened with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. You know, they made the brackets wider, they got rid of the personal exemptions, they increased the standard deduction, they did a lot of this. Um, I'm not going to say it's smoke and mirrors, because at the end of the day, they did have to fit it into a box of, you know, fulfilling a budget requirement, which they did. Um, so the tax rates, there was a bracket shift, which I'm sure you all saw as well. Rates were reduced, which we saw as well. And there still was a marriage penalty at the top rates. There's, that's really, nothing has changed from year to year with that. There's always usually a marriage penalty at the top rates. But again, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act just did a lot of this. And at the end of the day, it kind of equaled out. Um, some people, depending, you know, obviously no individual tax return is the same. So, you know, you might have seen a little bit of a benefit, but of course, living here in the tri-state area, we all know that the SALT deduction hit us pretty hard. So the SALT deduction hit us hard, but the brackets evened it out. It was a lot of this. So here's the tax rates from 2018 to 2019. Basically, everything is just indexed again for inflation. No changes with the rates for um, 2019, but the thresholds are again just slightly higher than 2018. So again, it's probably really small for you to see, but if you're looking at married filing joint, um, the highest tax bracket to 37%, 600,000 went to up to 612,350. So again, we just have a lot of indexing for inflation with this, which is no surprise. Come on, there we go. Similarly, our standard deduction index for inflation Next year, 2019, technically this year, I guess, um, it's going to be $24,400 for married filing joint single. We're sitting at $12,200. And if you are blind or 65 years or older, you do have that bonus standard deduction that you're eligible for. And again, it's just kind of indexed for inflation. So no changes here. Um, the standard deduction is still doubled, so that'll still remain nothing significantly different than what we were used to in 2018. Any questions, concerns, comments? All right. So like I mentioned earlier, the SALT deduction, it hit us hard here in the tri-state area. Our property taxes are high. Um, there were a lot, a lot, a lot of chatter about, you know, protesting this and, you know, hitting the IRS for, you know, lawsuits. Or, there was a lot of stuff that happened, obviously. They didn't budge. So we're still stuck at the SALT limitation at $10,000. And medical, like I mentioned earlier, it's up to 10% of a floor, which was last year was 7.5%. Um, suspended was a home equity interest deduction. Personal casualty losses. If you're in a federally declared disaster area, though, you are still able to claim a casualty loss, but you have to be in a federally declared disaster area. There's still a 10% cap on this as well, or floor on this as well. And we said goodbye to our 2% deduction. So uh, we'll get into these a little bit more in detail on the next several slides. But overall, these were our itemized deduction changes, which faced us in 2018. They will remain going forward through 2025.
So a little bit into our favorite deduction of salt. Our state and local taxes, our sales taxes, our personal property taxes, and our real property all get lumped into that one number. And what the IRS did, which I, I kind of find it comic that they did this, is on Schedule A, they actually showed us what our total deduction would have been. And then they said, nope, just kidding. You only get $10,000. So I'm like, that's kind of, that's, that's mean. But um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of my clients are, they, they basically were like, I lost out on this much money. And, you know, it's really sad, but that's the way the cookie crumbled. So it does not apply to business or rental properties or home office business use percentages for the self-employed. There's a whole other calculation that goes into that. Um, but at the end of the day, your standard deduction, your, um, I'm sorry, your itemized deductions, your SALT, you're capped at 10 grand for married filing joint. So medical expenses are long-term care insurance. Again, just index for inflation. If you're 60 to 70 years old for 2019, it's going to be 4,220, um, up slightly from 4,160. No major changes here. Premiums qualify for medical or qualified self-employment <coughs> health insurance. Emotional support animals, basically you can go online and get a certificate for any sort of animal being emotional support these days. Um, I was getting my nails done a couple weeks ago and I saw a girl walking down the street holding a lizard with a little jacket on it that said emotional support. And I had a double look because I said a lizard. I mean, I've seen dogs, well, we've all seen dogs, um, but it was a huge lizard. She was walking down the street with a lizard. Can't make it up. My parents live in Clinton, New Jersey. You see everything out there. Um, but you do need proof of primary purpose of the animal. And there is supposed to be medical care to alleviate a mental defect or illness. That's the technical reason for an emotional support animal. Um, but again, I feel like you can go online and get a certificate for anything these days. So those are deemed legitimate medical expenses for emotional support animals. And again, you have to hurdle the 10% floor before you're even able to see a deduction for medical expenses, which I'm sure you guys already know. Very, very small font, but it's basically every medical expense under the sun in detail. Um, I had a client once, and she would give us a huge paper that would literally list out all of her vitamins, all of her essential oils, um, her batteries for her smoke alarm, you name it, it was on this piece of paper. And I, I actually, I shouldn't even say it was my client. I was an intern when I remember doing this tax return. I was preparing it. And, you know, my name's Nicole DeRosa, initials ND. So I remember looking at the prior year work paper and seeing ND written all over this work paper, right? And I was like, why are my initials all over this work paper? Non-deductible. <laughs> Non-deductible expenses. So um, yeah, her vitamins, her essential oils, her batteries, whatever she listed on this paper, and unless it was prescribed by a doctor, obviously, um, non-deductible expense. So here's a list. It's not all inclusive, but it's, it's pretty detailed. So All right, mortgage interest. So this is something else that hit some people um, a little bit. Again, um, you always have to ask the client, you know, what the intent or purpose of things are for. Um, we like to say CYA, cover your fill in the blank. New acquisition debt is now limited to 750,000. It used to be 1 million. Um, again, if, you're, if it's old debt, it's grandfathered into the 1 million, no longer 1.1 million because the deduction for interest on equity borrowing has been suspended, so no more $100,000 there. Home equity debt, again, you have no deduction on the interest for this home equity debt. So a lot of times we found ourselves asking clients, what is the purpose of this? Um, and if it was to improve substantially, you know, build their home, okay. But if it was, you know, just a line of credit or whatever taken out on their, for whatever reason, college for their kids, no longer deductible as interest expense. Audits have been expanded. I have seen tax notices that are specifically targeting the mortgage interest deduction on Schedule A. And basically, it's low-hanging fruit. And now the uh, mortgage interest statement uh, 1098 has the actual date of the acquisition and has the debt in there. So again, that's furnished the IRS, so they know that it's coming. And they are looking at this date. And basically, they're sending notices out, and they're asking you to prove the calculation of your mortgage interest deduction. Um, one of the clients I worked on a couple years back, they received it two years in a row. They received this notice. And we basically just had to furnish to them the mortgage statements, our calculation, and it was a no change. But still, they are definitely targeting this. It's low-hanging fruit. It's easy. So 
keep that in mind. So charity, 60% of the AGI limit, it's up from our historical 50%. So this was a win for a lot of individual clients who are very charitable with their giving. Conservation contributions, not sure how many of you see this. Um, I can't say I've seen it in practice actually ever. But for farmers, it's 100% up from 30%. And for non-farmers, it's up from 30% to 50 Documentation, nothing has really changed here. You're still required to have documentation if it's more than $250. Per contribution, vehicle donation, make sure you have that Form 1090-C. It has to be attached to the tax return as well. Um, form 8283, <laughs> I have another client. I like telling stories. She would donate her Louboutins, her Chanel this, her Dior that, designer everything underneath the sun. And we really couldn't take much of a deduction for it. It was clearly worth more than $5,000, but she didn't have a qualified appraisal for anything. She just donated it to Goodwill. So we were kind of capped. We took a $4,950 deduction for it for non-cash contributions on Form 8283. And that was that. Every year she does the same exact thing. And every year she asks the question, why? Um, but so if you're over $5,000 for any group of assets that were contributed, you want to get a qualified appraisal, which in turn needs to be attached electronically to the tax return. Bunching deductions. Now that the standard deduction has been doubled, um, a tax planning idea that you know we've pitched to a lot of our clients, if you're kind of on the verge of taking the standard deduction or not, we've basically said, if you're donating $5,000 of charity a year, why don't you donate $10,000 one year, zero the next year, and $10,000 the year after. So basically, you're kind of bunching your deductions into the same period so you are able to maximize your standard deduction or your itemized deductions. It's just a tax planning technique that you know we use. Um, it's legal, obviously. We're a cash basis taxpayer, so whenever you donate, that's when you take the deduction. So bunching charitable contributions is an option now that the standard deduction has been doubled. All right. So gambling losses limited to gambling winnings. Um, Keep in mind, New Jersey accepts that as well. A lot of states are different with regard to that. Gambling losses, you can bring it down to zero in New Jersey. Um, obviously, you can't go below zero because we are a gross income state. Casualty and theft losses, I mentioned earlier. Personal, no longer. Unless you are in a federally declared disaster area, you are able to take a casualty loss. This is on irs.gov. You can look up to see if you are in a federally declared disaster area, if you qualify. If you are, same 10% floor threshold applies, plus you have $100 per casualty. So the concept and the calculation has not changed. It's the only thing that has changed is who is able to take this deduction now. And I'd mentioned earlier, we said goodbye to our 2% deductions, our tax prep fees, our advisory fees, which hit a lot of people very hard because a lot of people pay a lot of money for people managing their funds, um, unreimbursed business expenses as well. We said goodbye to all of those. The only flexibility that you know people do have is if they have a business or a Schedule C or rental properties, we did successfully shift tax prep fees and allocate them to their activities accordingly um, because it is some of it is technically attributable to the preparation of those forms. So they might not have lost the tax prep fees completely, but unfortunately the advisory fees and the unreimbursed business expenses, they did lose. So, Okay, we're going to Hawaii. I don't know about you guys, but I would love to go to Hawaii right now. It's a little cold outside. So this is the draft 2019 1040. It looks a lot like it used to, and I am excited about that because I had a call this morning actually with a client who their return was filed back in May, and they were looking at their tax return for the first time since it's been filed today. I had a call at 9.15. He's like, it, it, line one plus line two plus line three plus line four plus line five doesn't equal, it doesn't foot. We all know the return doesn't foot because uh, you have to take into account schedule one and add that in, then it foots. But he just didn't understand the, the new 1040, how it didn't foot. But guess what? As of right now, knock on wood, we are back to what looks a lot like our old 1040, which makes me very happy because I'm a creature of habit. I don't like when things change. So now that we're back to this, makes me happy. Very similar to what we've been used to in the past. Um, a little bit different up top, but we have our wages, our interest, our dividends. 
it basically foots down. Mm -hmm. How many pages will that be, Nicole? Two? Um, yes, again, two. Happy six. <laughs> not, well, I mean, it's like, it's two plus the schedule, so it's really eight. But um, this is, no, two, but you still have your schedules. You still do have some schedules. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, we're not we're not fully back to our old 1040, but we are good. close. <laughs> um, yeah, because as you'll see right here, you have a schedule one. So adjustments to income is pulling from schedule one. So, you know, they did cut and paste things around yet again on us. At least it's organized. Right? Yes, and it foots. Right. <laughs> so I think that was a lot of um, people's complaints that the return actually didn't foot. So 2019, page one, 2019, page two. So it's like a postcard and a half-ish, if you will, I guess. Um, I, this stuff just unnecessary, but, um, but again, it's very similar to what we're used to in the past. And I don't know, how many people have you seen this before? How many of you have heard about this, the new 1040 senior? How many of you know the difference? The font is bigger. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Look it up. Google it. The font is bigger. I, I kid you not. <laughs> oh, I, don't even, I wouldn't even. No, they, they did have it. They did have it. No? I thought they did. Now they have the date back. Yeah, date's, that date's definitely there. Yeah, so. And if you look at the senior form, just bigger font. Google it. I kid you not. So millions of visits to the IRS.gov. Um, this, I'm not surprised about. Again, this is only through April 15th. It's not through October. This entire year, everyone was constantly educating themselves on the new changes because we were all kind of left in the dark, if you will, I feel like. We were, you know, guinea pigs. It was the first time we saw a lot of different things. And I felt like that was me half the time. I always got like the first client that had X, Y, and Z and I had to figure it out. But I was going to the IRS.gov a heck of a lot more than in the past. And this clearly proves that so was everybody else. And I wasn't just doing that myself. So visits to the IRS.gov up significantly, 400 and almost 34 million compared to 400 in the past just visits alone. I know I was looking up instructions to form 8990, um, like all the time, I feel like. Um, but yeah, so again, constant education was a general theme of this past tax season, just because of all the changes of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Our favorite friend, QBI, Section 199A. Um, we knew about this because that was pretty much at the forefront. We started learning about this last year, probably before November of last year. And obviously, it began in 1-1-2018. It goes through 2025, just like the other individual changes. Reduces income subject to federal income taxes, but not self-employment taxes or AMT. It was very beneficial to a lot of our clients who had flow-through income, who had rental properties. Um, it definitely helped out the general business person. And a lot of these returns were extended as well, so we didn't see as many that went out for April. But um, on our old postcard 1040, that's, that's where it was, line 10. And what was a QBI deduction? Basically, any individual, or sorry, an individual taxpayer may deduct 20% of their qualified business income from a partnership S Corp or sole proprietorship. So if you had a Schedule C, if you had a Schedule E rental properties, if you had a K-1 with flow through income from a partnership or an S Corp, you could possibly have received a 20% um, deduction on this income. Again, um, it depended if it was actually qualified business income. That was kind of like the first test. And you know, if you were eligible to take the deduction, it was capped at the greater of, we had a 50% wage test and a 25% um, w-2 wages and 2% of UBIA, unadjusted business, um, basically your assets, 2%, 2.5% of that. So if an individual earns less than a buck 60 and change, you didn't really have to worry about the other limitations. It was basically like a phased in limitation. So if you didn't make enough money, it was very easy. You just took 25% or 20% of that number, which was great. But realistically speaking, a lot of people in practice, they make a lot more than you know, 160,000 if they have a business. So we had to factor in these different thresholds. So, you know, if they made less, that was great. It was easy peasy. Um, we developed a lot of work papers in some, I, 
work for with them. So we developed a lot of internal work papers to make sure the system was properly calculating this deduction because we know that the IRS is going to be targeting this deduction because obviously it's a deduction, they target it. Um, and software, you know, we had a lot of issues with software this year because everything was so new. The software companies were a little bit late on making things properly flow and calculate. So we made sure that it was properly calculating before we pushed that button to send it up to the e-file land. So what is a trader business? IRC section 162 um, defines trader business. And basically, performing services as an employee, you can have multiple trades or businesses. You could have rental activity. They qualify as well. Um, we also have this theme of common control. And it also has to be 50% or more to be considered common control. So I'm not going to go into crazy detail on QBI. Um, but what I will, I won't read this for you, but basically, we had this concept of SSTB, Specified Service Trader Businesses. I call this the naughty list. Um, if you are a doctor, if you are an architect, if you are an accountant, um, we were on the naughty list. And if you are an SSTB, it's not the greatest um, because you have to worry about those limitations and you're also not eligible for what's called aggregation, which again, I'm not going to go into crazy detail, um, but aggregation is definitely a benefit. And if you are an SSTB on the naughty list, you are not eligible for aggregation. So this is not an all-inclusive list of the naughty list, but it just kind of gives you an idea of who is on there. So aggregation, I like to just call this grouping, because basically that's what it is. When you aggregate, you basically group. Um, the same person or group of persons have to own 50% or more. So again, we have this kind of control theme that we're working with here. These are the criteria for aggregation. If you do not meet these criteria, you cannot group. And the reason why you would want to group is, you know, maybe I have a business that literally it's just income. There's no wages. There's no assets. It's just income. But I have another business now where there's wages and there's assets. This business over here that has neither of those, I won't really get a deduction for it if I make too much money because those deduction limits, they phase in, right? But if I'm able to aggregate them together and treat them as one activity rather than two, I will get a bigger deduction. So a lot of times we found ourselves trying to maximize this QBI deduction, um, and by aggregating, we were able to do that. The thing with aggregating is once you, once you aggregate, once you group them together, you can't ungroup them in the following year. It's an irrevocable election. You can bring other activities in to the group, but you can't go and undo it. So we needed to make sure also that once you aggregate, um, that it's gonna be in place for future years and you didn't you know, make a mistake by aggregating. We didn't aggregate, if, I'm sorry, we aggregated only if we needed to, basically. Because again, you're stuck with it once you do it. So, and I mentioned before, if you're on the naughty list, you can't aggregate. Um, so it's very important to make sure that the income even qualifies in the first place. I like to call this guy the silent monster because when we were learning about QBI and SSTBs and trader businesses and all this jazz, we had 163J that just basically snuck up and bit us. I think that 163J was extremely uh, more complicated than QBI and a lot of the returns that went on extension dealt with this and we kind of found ourselves figuring things out as it happened um, just because there was a lot more moving parts with it. And again, it's, next year will be interesting because everything also now carries forward, right? So the limitations on interest carrying forward will be interesting in 2019. Do I see a hand or no? Yawn. No yawn. Okay. <laughs> no yawn. Uh, form 8990 is where the business interest limitation is calculated. It is tr a tricky form. Our tax software didn't do this right for half of the year. Um, you have a 25 million gross receipts test, and basically it's a taxpayer that has a business interest expense, whether it's mortgage, um, personal, and you, you name it. Whatever interest it is, it needs to go on this form. I deal a lot with auto dealerships. They're my, a lot of my clients are auto dealerships, so we have this thing called floor plan interest. Don't even get me started with that, but that was a whole other issue with this whole limitation. Um, if you have a disallowed business interest expense that's carried forward, obviously this year we didn't have that because it was the first year. Next year we'll have that. 
And if you have a current year or prior year excess business interest expense. <coughs> so you had to file this form if any of those applied, not just if you had a business interest expense. So it was filed a lot more than we had anticipated. Again, it was like the silent monster. I don't think any of us anticipated how much trouble this one form would give us. Um, and if you have a pass-through entity that's allocating excess taxable income or excess business interest income, you had to file this form as well. We have begun to see tax notices disallowing business interest expense already. Um, two weeks ago, right before I went to an automotive conference, one of our clients received a notice and they disallowed $809,000 of an interest expense. And the IRS is actually wrong. We calculated it correctly, but now we have to go back to the IRS and say, no, they weren't subject to the limitation. And this is why we properly did X, Y, and Z. And it'll eventually just, they'll say yes, but they're targeting this too. So they are on top of it. Um, and it was literally $809,000 of deduction. They just said, nope, we're not allowing it. So. What were the annual sales for that company? Um, they were the company that received the notice? Yes. They were not 25 million. Their controlled group was under the 25 million. That's what I was thinking. No, nope. they were not subject to the, that's the thing. And um, if any of you are familiar with the partnership tax return, there's a whole slew of questions. We properly checked the box. No, they are not subject to the limitation. So again, they just, the IRS came in and disallowed it. And like they, I said, it's a- the return showed 25, less than 25 in gross. Well, the average three year prior was less, yes. The problem is it's 25 aggregated, so it could be 25 other tax returns. Their control, no, but the control group was yeah. actually under. Yeah. It was an automotive yeah, return, serious. which again, the floor plan interest I mentioned earlier, that's a whole nother disaster. Um, but yeah, no, they were actually not subject. Their control group was not subject. So they shouldn't no, have been limited. The to begin with. It, and what the notice literally had is it had taxable income as filed, taxable income as computed. You know, the IRS recomputed it. And the difference was the interest of the 809,000. They just disallowed the entire thing. So, it'll be interesting to see these start to come out of the woodwork, all these notices. Keeps things interesting, you know? So we're gonna go into a lot of miscellaneous ancillary issues to wrap it up. Um, and obviously, like I said, any questions, feel free to ask. Interrupt me, please. Um, S corporations, basis schedules were a big deal this year because we are now required to attach them to the tax return. We were required in prior years as well, but this year they really, really kind of put their foot down with it and said if you have a loss, a distribution, a distribution of stock, or a loan repayment that was received, you have to attach this basis schedule to your tax return. They actually added a checkbox, and on the individual tax return, I know our software gave us a diagnostic and wouldn't let us e-file the return if we didn't have a basis schedule attached. So this was a little excerpt from Schedule E. It says check if basis computation is required all the way in column E. So they kind of you know added an extra column. But yeah, they were required to be attached this year. And with that also being said, this is a pro forma letter on an IRS notice that I have not personally seen any, but apparently they are out there. And if you are required to attach a basis schedule to your individual tax return and you didn't, this is a notice that you will be receiving. Again, low hanging fruit. If you're taking a loss, no substantiation, the IRS is probably gonna question it. Um, like I said, I haven't personally seen these myself. I think they're throwing all the basis schedules in the corner and they're probably gonna collect dust and sit there for quite some time before they do anything with them, but yeah. They, they're claiming it's a new initiative, but I haven't seen anything of it yet. Items not repealed under TCJA, which I, were, I was really hoping for AMT just to just go away. Um, I think we all kind of were, same with the net investment income tax, because quite frankly, why? Um, <laughs> But NII is still here. We have that 3%, 3.8% tax, unfortunately, still around. AMT, well, at least we got to go away for corporate purposes, right? We kind of won a little bit half of the battle there. Unfortunately for, for individual, it's still here. Uh, but the good thing is they kind of reset everything, and now it's going to be indexed for inflation appropriately. So it'll be actually intended for who it would have originally intended for. Um, so for the exemption for married individuals, 2019, a law, 111,700, phase out, 1 million and change. Uh, basically, again, it's just indexed for inflation. But we're stuck with AMT for quite some time, it seems like that's never going away. Maybe we'll get lucky one day, but at least not for the next couple of years. Come on. There we go. 
Uh, kitty tax. This was kind of like a win and a lose, in my opinion, because a lot of times we would have to link the kid's tax return to the parent's tax return to, in order to get, you know, the, the parent's rate and the kid's stuff to ta be taxed at the parent's rate. Well, now what they did is they said, nope, don't have to worry about that anymore. We're just going to tax you at the trust and estate rate, which, yes, you don't have to link the returns anymore. You don't have to wait for the parent's return to get filed anymore but you're taxed at a higher tax rate. So again, it's kind of a little bit of a catch-22. Um, I think it's better, though, because we can get these tax returns out earlier in the year now. We don't have to wait till October. But um, minor's income, you either have two options, Form 8615 or 8814. Um, and it applies if the child is under the age of 19 or if they're a student and they're not supporting themselves and obviously they don't have significant in earned income. They don't file a joint return. And I mentioned they don't have a significant amount of income, so it has to be low, and they're taxed at the trust rate. So this is the change here. So instead of waiting and being taxed at the parents' rate, there's tax at the trust rates instead. And obviously, they do get a little bit more steep if they make more money, 20%. So tax credits, we have the adoption credit that's now indexed for inflation, education and tuition credits. Nothing really changed here. Again, just index for inflation. The thresholds really still aren't that high. Um, so if you make too much money, you're kind of up a creek without a paddle on that one. Electric vehicle credit, um, the Tesla and, and General Motors have already started to phase out. So if any of you are familiar with the um, electric vehicle credit, basically once you hit a certain amount of manufactured vehicles that are sold, the credit will then cut in half and then cut in half again until it's basically gone. Tesla did hit, I think it's like 200,000 200, or something like that, um, but their credit was cut in half already. So just make sure that, you know, if you're getting a Tesla, you go online and make sure the credit is what it is before you take it. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's completely phased. It's gone out. already. The electricity credit is for all electric vehicles, not just like Tesla and GM. So I think they reached that to it. I know. So I know Tesla last year. I had somebody who got two, who bought two, one for his business and one for his personal, and he was mad <laughs> that he was only able to get half the credit. He's like, what? And you have to purchase it. You can't. Yep. It has to be. Yeah. He did it like in. I want to say he did it in like late November, um, and he did he did get the credit, but it wasn't as much as he thought. Yeah. So premium tax credit, um, no penalty going forward 2019 on. This is great. Um, earned income credit and Form 8867 was pretty much exploded into multiple columns this year. And a lot of returns required Form 8867 if it was being prepared by a paid pa tax repair um, to basically cut down on fraud and, you know, make sure that you weren't claiming credits for clients that shouldn't have received the credits. It was a pain in the butt to prepare, but I think it was a great initiative and great idea of the IRS to kind of do this. And they did cut down significantly on these fraudulent credits. Child and family tax credit expanded to a family tax credit for other dependents, you know, taking care of mom and dad, if they live with you type of deal. Their other dependent credit is $500. Again, we have Form 8867. It's required for this credit as well. And nothing has changed really at all for this credit. It remains the same going into 2019. The phase out hasn't even been indexed. It's the same. They increased it though um, significantly because obviously with the um, repeal of the personal exemption and the dependency exemptions, they wanted more people to be able to basically qualify to get this type of credit. So they did boost the income thresholds a little bit to soften the blow as the IRS would say. So long-term capital gains and qualified dividend rates, um, they remain the same. The brackets, again, just they did a lot of shifting. That's what happened here. Rates, though, still the same. Um, you'll see at the joint rate, 20% hits $488,000 and change, 15% 78000 and change. Net capital loss, we're still at the annual 3000 limit. We're stuck with the NII we talked about before. And we still have the 25% capital gains as well, or collect collectible. And we are getting close. Meals and entertainment. Um, really, the only change here was that, well, it depends. Depends on a lot of things. Um, meals provided to employees included in their compensation went from 100% down to 50. And meals to employees through an eating facility went down, again, to 50 as well. Um, one of the biggest 
things and the biggest outrages, I guess, was if you're taking your client to a sporting event, right? And the meals had to be separately stated in order to get the deduction. If it wasn't separately invoiced and it was just on, you know, the invoice as one lump number, well, guess what? That was 0% deductible. But if you have the meals carved out, then you are at least eligible to take 50% of that deduction. So, but again, it had to be separately stated. And that is all I have. Any questions? <laughs> Speed against all, I know. I talk very fast. <laughs> no questions. So what are you hearing out of Washington about future changes to what the current tax structure that we have? Anything? Not that I've heard. Nothing. No. It'll be interesting over the next year, though, because of the election. I, 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 I hate that, <laughs> but it's unfor we're unfortunately going to probably be affected by it. I would assume some things are going to change. I don't foresee everything staying exactly the same like they had planned it through 2025. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, you, you have any knowledge on this. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but the New Jersey they were talking about creating these charitable uh, Organizations, funds, or trusts for the whatever, salt deduction. For the salt deduction, and then they that was knocked down. Yep. But they also pointed out to the fact that there were a number of states in the United States that were doing this. I don't understand how this. I don't. I think they were knocked down as well. There, I think California was one of them. I know New York was another, and I want to say. Okay. Yeah, it was a lot, mostly tri-state area, but I know there was one in California yeah, too. Yeah, put it as an entity level. Tax. Yeah, but I think it ultimately got struck down. It, because it was weird. It was, entity, it was an entity level tax. And if you were an individual, you got a credit for it. But if you were out of state, you did not get a credit. Right. So you ended up being taxed for it. Yeah, I don't, I honestly, I thought it kind of got struck down. I didn't think it came actually to fruition. No, it's, uh, there was, the, the argument that I had heard was that some of the states, the middle states, where their property taxes are much lower, right. and yet they're still funding schools, et cetera, with mm -hmm. this. They were able to create these charitable deductions yeah. for the payment. And I didn't see any those of that. That was I, I couldn't get more traction on it. That's. Yeah, because I mean, the, I, I, I don't think they were. The NJCPA, you, there was an initiative, I believe, with the state society, too, on this. And it was struck oh, down. Yeah, yeah, one of the counties uh, I think it was in um, Bergen County uh, who was attempting to do that. And it, it really fell in depth here. Some of the ones that were already in place, there were certain triggers that, that allowed them to do that because a certain percentage had to go to specific things. And I think that was part of the thing. But both of all, I know Menendez and Pasquale got together to try to do a bill. And I think Maryland even jumped the light of day because IRS came out uh, very quickly with some regs that said no. that would, those would be squashed. Because that was we spoke about that. We have like an annual tax training, and I remember in December our state and local group <coughs> had talked about this potential tax planning idea, um, but it never came to fruition. So. Thank you. Hmm? Anybody else? Okay. You guys want to get out of here and beat traffic, that's what it is. <laughs> 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 Thank you.